Hello everyone, my name is Adrian Battle Marston and I work in the Office of Inclusion and Institutional Equity. We are back with another episode of TU Stories. So I have two special guests with us here today and I'm gonna give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. Hi, uh, so I am Ashley Todd Diaz. I am the Assistant University Librarian for Special Collections and University Archives. And I'm Felicity Knox. I am the Assistant University Archivist. Now, how long have each of you sort of been here working at Towson? Or I should say be, been at Towson, probably. I'll start with you because I think I already knew this. <laughs> right? <now>. It's a, <laughs> so I actually graduated from Towson in 1994, and then I came back since 2000, and I've been in the archive since 2009. I came to Towson in 2016. How different has have things been? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, we've got like new buildings. Yeah. Things have moved around. Yeah, it's a very, so when I returned um, in 2000 from when I had been here in 1994, it wasn't that different, but mm -hmm. in um, starting around 2010, there had been master plans that got put into place about uh. the campus and how it would grow and change. And so every year it's very different. So I say I have like lenses that kind of filter over my eyes mm. from my own experience here as a student, from my time here as an employee, and then from what I know about the school's history. Yeah, so. I was going to say, like, how how much history or documentation do you all have of, like, the 90s? And then uh, do you think, but like, oh, yeah, I was, I was there for that. <laughs> no, so my f biggest fear was, like, going through things like the yearbooks or the newspapers, because I didn't get a yearbook. I didn't sit for a picture. I was in a play when I was a freshman, and so I just had these fears of finding myself in, like, footage and stuff, <laughs> but there's nothing. So, um... <laughs> And that's a big problem, actually, in archives, that we don't have a lot of things from when things start to become electronic. Mm. Um, that's a big problem for us. We lose a lot of stories and history because yeah. they're not accessible the same way paper is. Yeah. And there's also an element. People don't think of themselves in a historic context. So that's true. So the more recent history is to us, People aren't thinking about saving it or preserving it and sending it to the archives. But if you come across, say, an old box of stuff in the closet and yeah. you have no connection to it anymore, it's much easier to give it to the archives. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you came 2016. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, around the time when Occupy Towson It was a few happened. months after Occupy Towson. Oh, my goodness. So you're, I'm assuming your interview process is happening kind of yes, synonymous. Yes, actually, in, it was November, so it was probably wow. within a few days of Occupy mm -hmm. Towson. <laughs> Did any of that, I'm, I don't know if, how much of that would probably come up in the interview process, but were you familiar with the, the conversations happening? Oh, no, wow. I didn't, I didn't know anything that was going on about that. So. Man. I was on the, the team that helped hire Ashley, and quite honestly, I think we were spending so much time trying to understand our candidates that we didn't spend yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, of time yeah, yeah. <laughs> explaining all of the intricacies about, I mean, I think we were pretty upfront about what the campus was like, yeah. but I don't know that we were talking about things like Occupy Towson, because I think they were still happening, and it was sort of That's true. hard to see like the ramifications of what that would be down the road. Yeah, I guess it's a little bit easier, like in retrospect, mm -hmm. to sort of document the things that you've sort of seen and the cause and effect of, yep. of everything there. I guess that's kind of like a good segue into <laughs> the work that you all do. So you all are in the library, mm -hmm. but the work that you do is not, I would say, identical to maybe how a student would associate employees in the library. Mm -hmm. You do a very unique work. Can you sort of describe what that's like for people that may not be familiar with what Archives does at Towson? We have the kind of the privilege and the responsibility of maintaining the university's memory. Mm. Um, so understanding what's going on and who is on campus, what, is, what are the primary um, decision points and things that are of interest and importance to the students, faculty, staff, and administration but also to help keep people accountable. So if there were things like Occupy Towson, 
how have we moved on from that? What what decisions have been made? Um, what is still in need of changing or, or yeah. thought? Um, so we are trying as best as we can to collect as many voices and perspectives as possible so we have as authentic a memory and understanding of what's going on on our campus. And then also making sure it's preserved and available and discoverable so that everybody on campus feels like they are able to use the resource, that they're able to contribute to it, uh, that they are able to access us online or in person, ask questions. To a certain extent, trying to make connections across campus yeah. and build trust with people so they know that when they share materials with us, we are going to care for them and not edit them or um, share them with, say, um, in the wrong context or with people that might use them in a, in a way that could be damaging, but that we're providing resources as openly as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that is one area that I don't know if I've always thought about, the like the memory of the campus mm -hmm. and what that looks like. Right. How does that process sort of go of like determining what are like important moments? Because mm. I'm assuming there's probably a lot of like discernment in that, mm. like deciding yeah. what goes and where you put your time and energy, I guess. To some extent, but we also are really interested in capturing what um, just exists on campus. Because again, we can't look forward and say, oh, this thing will be really important in five years. Right. We work with um, a TSUM class where we talk about the history of campus, the history of Towson, and they're looking at all sorts of things because it's they decide what their research project is going to be, mm -hmm. and so they have all you know the entire archives is open for their um, research, and they've got some really interesting ideas about what they want to explore, and so if we have any material that they can use to back up their research projects, then that's great. So we you know student organizations student life, all sorts of things that we might not think of as momentous moments, but they tell a story about what campus is like at that moment in time. Uh, so we want to have all all viewpoints, all aspects covered as and, best we can. And now it's like you're capturing like first-hand accounts from students now, yeah, as opposed right. to maybe reading documents and trying to get a pulse of what the right. sort of campus climate was like. And that's the thing that we've worked really hard at trying to do better at is gathering voices that aren't just the administration or yeah. just faculty mm -hmm. or, um, you know, the committees that are meeting to discuss certain elements that, yeah, that's that tells you this side of the story, but that doesn't tell you the other pieces. Right. Now, you all have been a part of a project for a while now. It's titled Unearthing Towson's History. Mm -hmm. For people that may not be familiar, can you try to give like a general overview of like what is Unearthing Towson's History? Because there's probably a lot there in Towson's <laughs> history, but this feels like a very specific thing that you all are sort of trying to rediscover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so it came about in 2017 from a conversation that Brian, Hara, and I had had. Um, that we were interested in learning more about what aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion had been present on campus in the past and how we could learn from those campaigns or moments or events and better understand ourselves and kind of where we're going and where, where we still need to be headed mm -hmm. uh, by using a local context that people could relate to and feel invested in. But as we started doing that work, um, we realized how many gaps there were and how many silences and how many voices were missing within the archives. And so we hired um, a, a team of student researchers to help us start understanding what was in the archives, what gaps there were that we could possibly start filling in so that we could better tell these stories and own that authentic shared history. Um, so at this point, it's been going on since 2017. We've had over, gosh, I want to say over 12 student researchers wow. um, that have contributed to the project in different ways. Um, but it has not only started to develop a bibliography of resources that exist in the archives related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, 
but also started to start to actively fill in those gaps by reaching out to alumni and retired faculty and staff uh, to conduct oral histories and bring those voices literally into the collections. The conversation we had in 2017 was directly following a student symposium um, that was focused on student experience with DEI um, on campus and both positive experiences and negative experiences. Mm -hmm. And we realized that there was a lot our students had to share that we, you know, no one was giving them really that opportunity to be heard and to value their experience as expertise. So that I think was the first catalyst. And unfortunately after that first summer, I mean, there was, we were just kind of cobbling together funding, yeah. but there was a, a project that President Schatzel had heard about at Hopkins that was starting to conduct oral histories. And so um, in 2019, she offered some funding to start hiring more student assistants and um, conduct oral histories. We brought in Christian Cote from the history department and Brian and Christian and I started formulating more of an approach that we could really pull oral history into the project. What is the planning process like for something like this? Like, where do you begin? Like, in your first meeting, we're like, all right, this is where we start, <laughs> and this is where we go next, like, incrementally. Like, how did that look? I mean, we let our students lead, uh, you know, in terms of what their interests were, what their questions were. Um, as they were doing research in the archives and starting to familiarize themselves with our history, the questions that were rising to the top for them or the people that they said they wished they could have heard from yeah. started to create a list for us of who the priority people we would really like to get in contact with um, would be. And I mean, it's taken years. The first oral histories didn't happen until 2021, partially due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I think every year we, I mean, we find this in the TSUM, suddenly new ideas, new questions appear to us and we often will say you know even though we work with the materials every day we find new things or we see things in new ways absolutely that's absolutely true and you know that first cohort that they were doing they literally went through almost every box in the archives to mm. see if they could find material to create that bibliography of of the history of diversity um, on campus. They were finding things that, you know, I may have seen at some point but had forgotten about and then would bring up, oh, this thing, and that would make me think, oh, well, there's another thing that you should be looking at too. So it's a constant conversation, I think, that we learn from but also then can aid in, in furthering what that research looks like because of our own knowledge of what the records hold and because we understand the context of those records. So sometimes that's the thing that students really, both in the TSEM and in this program, they kind of get stuck on is, you know, it, some things are so outrageous to our modern eyes that we do have to kind of build in, you know, yes, these things are absolutely horrific, yeah. but let's also think about what was going on in the entirety of campus and beyond. So sometimes that perspective might make things even a little more <laughs> frustrating yeah, or difficult, yeah. but it helps sort of build the reality of what was happening. Even if we don't have the full picture, we have close to a larger picture to understand what was going on. We offer mentoring and yeah. that guidance, those questions that help direct the student researchers, but then also situate them within context or perhaps pull them back a little bit. Um, so the project is really a collaboration, I think, mm -hmm. between their interests and passions and the questions that they're bringing to the table and then how we can support and guide and throw out helpful questions along the way. I'm assuming throughout this process, um, with working with your students and you you all did like actually a bunch of interviews with a, a lot of different people were there I guess it's sort of a two-parter question but it's sort of centered around like biggest surprises that sort of came up um I guess we can start more on like a positive one where like oh I remember this moment very like vividly and then I guess another part um where 
it's a little bit sadder, but you were just sort of reminded of, mm -hmm. like, I guess the progress that I guess we've sort of made mm -hmm. over the years. Um, what are some of those bigger surprise moments that kind of come to your memory? You want me to start? Okay. So I don't really have as much to do with um, the interview pieces, but uh, in a prior role, I was doing a lot of outreach work. Mm -hmm. And so one of the interviews that we had was the first interview with Whitney LeBlanc. Yeah. So he was the first black faculty member at Towson. And so I talked about this at a reunion of alums from the 70s. Um, and so I spoke about how this is how we're using the records that they create. So to try and get them to think about donating records to us, I brought up the interview with Mr. LeBlanc. And I didn't know, but one of the people in the audience had been a student of his and actually acted in a production that he had oh, directed. Wow. And so because I brought it up in the midst of this reunion, she came up to me later and then emailed me and contacted me. So Linda Morris became part of the, the Unearthing Towson history, oh, yeah. history because we talked about it in a space that wasn't necessarily just for UTH. So I think that's the thing is understanding that you talk about it all over and you don't know who you're going to inspire mm -hmm. to get in contact with you. But it's something that we kind of push through every day to make it uh, known that this is the kind of work we're interested in doing. People often don't think of themselves as having expertise or um, or that their stories or memories will be useful mm -hmm. or impactful. So the amount of people that when we've approached them have said, me? <laughs> really? That yeah. you want to hear from me? Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know, the humbleness. Then when we do speak with them, they have amazing things yeah. to share. Yeah, and yeah. they provide such inspiration and opportunity for our students who see that they relate to them as students. Like they can all say that they were on this campus at some point in time taking classes, but to see where they have then gone off to um, is just, I don't know, really yeah. inspiring for us as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any of the interviewees and the people interviewing them there, when we've seen them in person at events and they have like a rapport and a connection yeah. because yeah. that is a really, I don't know, it's a special moment that they've both shared. Mm -hmm. So you can see that connection. So that's a generational connection yep. that's being yeah. made. That's so interesting how you all sort of bring that up, especially with the idea of, I, I don't consider myself being a part of like a timeline in history, mm -hmm. right? Particularly when it comes to, you know, like like the racial component, mm -hmm. whether it's in the in on our campus or in the United States in general, like there are key moments where I feel like there was like a, a moment where we sort of said, this is where we stopped considering historic moments as like impactful, like civil rights era kicks in and we sort of place that rightfully so mm -hmm. in a category of important history. Mm -hmm. Right. And then in that category, there are like specific people who right. replace as like important historical figures. Right. But there's so many other people that were doing things outside of like the normal names that we hear. And then post civil rights era, there's also a number of things that have sort of happening. And I feel like it's probably similar like here yeah. on our campus also of like, yeah, like maybe this is 30, 40 years, you know, after, you know, Brown versus Board. But there's probably still a number of like impactful things sure. that like you were a part of. Right that people would want to hear about. Right. I mean, I think that's part of what we do as we're working with materials is we're trying to build that timeline that doesn't, so we know about Occupy Towson, yeah. but students coming in don't know about Occupy Towson. Right. So we talk about that and then we back that up to the Black Student Union, the creation of the Black Student Union. But between 1970 and 2016, there's a whole host of exactly. things that have happened that we don't necessarily have all the information about. We may know some of the players, but we don't have a lot of things that we can use to talk about what was happening on campus in those 50 years. Yeah. I was here in the 90s, and I can tell you what was happening in the 90s, but I can tell you from my perspective, when I talk to people who were my peers, 
who were dealing with very different realities than what I was dealing with. Yeah. It's a very different view of this campus than what I was in. They have a perspective that I don't have, and maybe we don't know their names necessarily. They're not super famous on this campus, but they are giving us a better sense of what is actually mm -hmm. happening here. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a really important piece. Well, and I, I think to that point, when we spoke with Linda, she insisted that we speak with her and her sister because her sister was an alum from a few years prior to her and they had very different experiences yeah, I so that. i mean and they and the video is is really it's actually I'm, kind of funny yeah, because the linda bickering. will say something and her sister will be like no <laughs> And but you know those there's, those are two perspectives, mm -hmm. and whether maybe the timing their experience was really different, or the aspects of that campus community just hit them differently, and yeah. you know that is is important to recognize as well that we now have over twenty thousand students, and each of them is having a different mm -hmm. experience. So the more students we can encourage to share their experience with us and what organizations they were a part of or what um, points of activism were important to them, the, the more enriched our sense of what campus life was like. Yeah. Because our students' time on campus is generally four years. Right. And then you know they don't they don't know what's happened before that or after that. Mm -hmm. So the more we can fill in those gaps and encourage that sense of belonging from a different perspective, I mean that's mm -hmm. one of our driving things. You all mentioned the idea of like there's sort of maybe decades long gaps yeah. mm -hmm. in between pivotal moments yes. that I feel like can add more context to probably like. A, a long process of like build up maybe a frustration of pain yeah. Yeah. that would make a very uh, dynamic approach to change it would help it make a lot more sense yeah you know absolutely um i feel like that that there's like that era of like maybe like 2014 to 2020 you saw an influx particularly in college campuses of like demanding more mm -hmm. Um, attention to diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion and a lot of their approaches for many people it caught them off guard mm -hmm. right that sort of happened on on my um, alumni campus where mm -hmm. there was a similar protest and there were a lot of students a lot of parents a lot of alumni that were like angry mm -hmm. because the I guess you could say approach or, or, or methods that they sort of used were they were uncomfortable mm -hmm. right we actually held somewhat of a panel a year after where one of the individuals involved with it provided a lot of context mm -hmm. with speaking with hundreds of black alumni mm -hmm. that had not even thought of not just like giving back to school but having stepped foot on yeah. campus for for homecomings um, for reunions for appreciation days you yeah, know yeah. that can sometimes happen on like graduation weekends right and when they'll say things like yeah what you're describing here we were also describing it in this instance mm -hmm. um, the demands that we made for for this particular department or for this uh, particular position we made like 30 years ago yes. like here's a documentation yes. it just sort of shows how your experience can have a lot of blind spots mm -hmm. and you can really go through your college experience without thinking of like the racialized lens component Absolutely. that can happen you know um and then when that does happen that shock of like wait where is all of this anger or yeah. sort of frustration coming from i'm imagining you all probably picked up on a lot of that yeah. in, in your research yeah. You know, I was here on campus in the 90s. In the 90s, we were very much, um, there was a sense that we had done it. You know, we mm. checked it off. We made progress and we were great. We were past all that need for, um, you know, equity issues that we had done it. And so we know that that's not true anymore. And certainly as a white person on this campus, at that time, the, the institution was a primarily white institution. Mm. So... Yeah, I was not aware of what 
again, my peers were going through um, to try and uh, find be in a space that was as welcoming to them as it was to me. So that was eye-opening when I start, would talk to alums who, who had graduated at the same time. And I was mm. like, oh, right. <laughs> we had very different experiences. Yeah. I think that every little piece of information that we come across builds that picture up for us. And so, yeah, when I was a, a employee again and I'm watching students do the same thing, there are students leading the same protests um, there was a group of students um, in the mid 2000s called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle was the name of the organization, and they've since gone on and founded a nonprofit in Baltimore City. And they were reenacting that march to the administration that the Black Student Union had done in the 1970s, and they were calling on their peers for their blindness about what was happening on campus. They were writing articles in the Tower Light. Um, they were part of the debate team and they were highlighting those problems in their debates. Um, so that was really eye-opening for me. Those students were probably the first inclination I had that, yeah, things really are still kind of stuck where mm. they've been. Um, so I'm grateful for that group um, because they taught me a lot. And so when I see it being done over and over and over again, it feels almost despair, like, you know, that we, we haven't made progress, even though I know we have, it, you know, the campus looks completely different. Yeah. The students, the faculty, there's a huge difference between what was here when I was a student and now. But sometimes it does feel a little like we're just treading water. Like some of the pain you're hearing feels too similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And like how much of it is actually in the moment, how much of it is what is the the what Towson has always been. And mm. so therefore people have they already have ideas about mm -hmm, Towson mm -hmm. before they even step foot on campus. Um, and how much of it is borne out by what they see actually happening here. Yeah. I think it's that interest in being able to uh, collect those experiences, hear those voices, hear what people were trying to enact in the 90s or the 80s or the 70s so that it doesn't get brushed under the rug as new administrators come in or new students come in and they're unaware of what's happened. Yeah. So if we can acknowledge that we are helping to maintain that record um, and that people aren't starting over again when they see that there is pain and there are issues that we need to address, I think that helps the overall mission that much easier to, to see where we've been the long road ahead of us, but not feel like we're perhaps treading as much water, <laughs> you know, that there have been some wins um, or some progress made. But I mean, one a, a kind of eye-opening moment for me this fall, I mean, because the, um, the new way that the university is describing itself is as a minority majority institution. And so that's what our incoming students see Towson as. Mm -hmm. And I was working with a, a class of freshmen and we were talking about the history of the institution and I said something to the effect that, you know, until the 1950s we were segregated. And I saw two students look at each other and say, what, did you know that? <laughs> and I felt like I blew up their world a little bit. Yeah. Um, that what they had thought they were entering into in terms of this community was not actually that authentic picture. And even if it is now, I think embracing where we've been yeah. is incredibly important so that we don't just kind of brush aside the pain that has happened in the past and is still happening today. Yeah, I mean, one of the eye-opening things for me, especially um, when I was in college, is just sort of what happened after Brown versus Board. Yeah. And like, <laughs> you had a lot of school districts that were like, all right, like low key though, like are we gonna get in trouble if we don't? Hey, that happened here. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I'm saying. So when when they hear that that context of were there real sort of a, a real reprimand on spaces, the answer is no. And then if there aren't, 
you're going to have schools kind of dragging their feet yeah. along right. <laughs> without having to do anything. Until 1970, yep. when Hugh comes along and says, if you don't get your act together, we're going to pull your funding. Right. And so that's really the impetus of what happens. So we've got Hugh on the one hand, and we've got the Black Student Union pressuring the administration on the other hand. And so between those two things, that meant that they actually had to start really creating something meaningful yeah. when it comes to racial diversity on this campus. It was not perfect. It was not perfect for the next, what, 30, 40 years. So we're, we're closer. But yeah, it, it took a long time for this institution specifically to do uh, the right thing. Yeah. Spike Lee. Well, I know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one of the things that I actually found not jarring, but you're just sort of left to to really sort of reflect on it. Whenever we've sort of sat through one of your sessions that you do, I know you all bring it to our retreat that we have with our mm -hmm. students. Uh, I know some of my, I, I came with my colleagues one time when we sat mm -hmm. through, and we're sort of reading through a lot of historical documents mm -hmm. of the creation of Towson, how this area sort of came to be mm -hmm. what it was. And I sort of noticed like two things when I'm sort of reading and I can imagine it probably pops up for you all a lot. On the one hand, you're getting a lot of old language, mm. and you're in your list like, mm. you're just kind of <laughs> cringing at it a little yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then on the second hand, the language is racialized, mm -hmm. but in a very neutral way, yeah. right? Where they'll use a sort of term where you're like, oh, I see what you're getting <laughs> <Yeah>. at here. <laughs> what is that process like? because these people aren't really around anymore, you know? right? And so you're having to really try to decipher, like, mm -hmm. what what was the in, intent behind that sentence or this person using that word mm -hmm. or framing the context of Baltimore in that way? How do you sort of navigate through putting that together? Because it's not like you can't go and knock on their door and say, like, hey, <laughs> uh, question. <Right. laughs> what do, how do you sort of work through that? I think it's... It's one of the primary lessons that we aim to get across to our students that we need to be thoughtful consumers of information. And so mm -hmm. thinking critically and questioning what we're reading is incredibly important no matter what it is. So starting out with the context, who has written this document? Do they have some type of ulterior motive? Like why are they writing this and who is the recipient? So I think you, you're right that we we don't necessarily know without being able to ask the person, mm -hmm. but understanding that they likely did have a particular objective that they mm -hmm. were working towards mm -hmm. and understanding the racial climate in Baltimore and you know where we were in terms of our, our building when we were looking to move out of Baltimore. Um, so understanding the context as much as we can, we try to set up for the students, what is the scene, right? What's the time frame? What other documents are there that are contemporary that we can look to to see what else was happening at the time? Right. Who are the people involved? And as best we can infer based on all of that, and the, the knowledge, right, that we were a segregated school and we know that the administrators and faculty at the time had very different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how we can learn from that, and even if it's our best guess and we don't know for sure, we can get a sense of where the person right. was going. Right, and they were using those words for very specific reasons. Yeah. So even if they themselves, though that's not true, they <laughs> themselves were not in that, you know, they were pushing other folks who they thought they could manipulate in a way with specific language. Yeah. I want to sort of land the plane here a bit because we sort of talked a lot about the work that you all do and uh, sort of the, the history that Towson sort of had on, on a number of instances. You all, you all have been here for quite some time here, and I sort of pose this question to everyone. Um, obviously, you know, in the lens of, of uh, unearthing Towson and, and the work that you all do there, but just in general, um, what is the why behind the work that you all 
hope to continually accomplish and I, please I can start with you on this one sure um, so I often say I'm a curious person mm. you can take that how you want <laughs> um, I'm somebody who wants to understand why things are the way they are um, and so I landed in this position luckily where I can explore all those avenues and I have all the resources I could hope for at my fingertips and then we can go and find more if we want more um, passing those things along that knowledge along to other people when we work with TSEM students and they start to really dig into the things that they're interested in and I can help them connect those dots there is nothing more satisfying than watching somebody like turn a page, read something and go, oh, and I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. Like, that's like my thing. <laughs> that is, I love that. I love watching the light bulbs go off. So connecting history and Towson, I mean, I've been here forever. I love Towson, so good and bad. I love being able to share all aspects of it. So yeah, I'm very grateful to be in this position where I can do that. That's my why, just because I want to know things and I want other people to know things too. It's, still, it's a very good reason. <laughs> I'd say my why is being able to build a, a community um, where everybody feels like they have a place that they belong and they see connections to whether it's current members of that community or past mm -hmm. members of that community, but to help maintain a resource that is so important to our campus and our alumni community that tells their story and is able to bring them back to a time when they were here. Um, it's, I don't know, it, it allows us to connect with people on a personal level and share things with them across timelines, across decades, right? That. Um, we can then also show to our students and help them better see themselves in Towson's community and see the, the potential for where they could go. So I feel like we're kind of this unique space on campus that crosses decades yeah. Yeah. and being able to welcome people into that and help help empower them to feel like they can own part of that is is my why. Thank you all so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. For people that want to know where to find you, where do they go? So we are physically on the fifth floor of the library in Suite 505. We are also, our digital collections are online mm -hmm. at archives.towson.edu. Um, but yeah, we are happy to get emails or phone calls or just people dropping in. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Thank you both again. And for those of you that are watching or, or listening, we want to thank you all so much for tuning in, and we will see you all next time. Take care, everyone. <laughs>